الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وأهل بيت طاهرة يجمعين ما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We talked last week and the week before about the signs of creation the signs of Allah Ta'ala in creation in Surah Al-Nahl chapter 16 of the Quran and today, inshallah, we will talk about some verses and hadith, inshallah, which are familiar but are always worth reminding ourselves of. And the topic is the relationship which we have with Allah Ta'ala, the relationship of master and servant, and what that means, what that entails. Typically, when we talk about a master and a servant, we consider that by calling someone servant, it is something which indicates they are duty-bound to obey the master. But normally, this is not a term which is used to honor someone, but rather to emphasize their servitude. In the case of Allah Ta'ala, when Allah Ta'ala calls someone his servant, he does that to honor him. So the greater the master, the greater the honor of being called his servant. And so our Master Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was called on the night of Mi'raj into the heavens, into the presence of Allah Ta'ala and he was asked by what title he would want to be known he asked to be known as Abd, the servant of Allah and then Allah Ta'ala in Surah Al-Isra he called him in that first verse Subhana alladhi asra bi'abdihi Laylan min al Masjid al Haram. So he referred to him as his servant, honoring him through that title to say that he is the one who took his servant on a night journey, thereby honoring him. Honoring him for his dutifulness, honoring him by association, by proximity, indicating qurb, that he was near to him. In the same way, in Surah, uh, in, in uh, chapter 25, verse 63, Allah Ta'ala refers to the Ibadur Rahman. Ibadur Rahman. He again, he calls them Ibad. Ibad meaning servants. Servants of the Rahman. So by calling them his servants, he indicates that they are dutiful to him. This is the first thing to mention. And then, this term being a servant of Allah Ta'ala, what does it entail for us? What duties does it entail? What honor does it entail? There are some things which we are required to believe in without having seen them. This is the ghayb. آمنت بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسوله and so on. These are all things which we have not seen. And this is why they are known as ghayb. They are the things of the unseen. First on this list is Allah Ta'ala. آمنت بالله. We believe in Allah although we have not seen Him. If we have not seen Allah Ta'ala then how do we form a relationship with Him? Our parents for example, we know from the hadith there is reward for looking upon their face with love. We look at their faces and we see from their expressions the love that they have for us. The care which they provide for us. We see it with our eyes that they provided for us. We see their actions. We see the love in their eyes and we reciprocate with our own love and our own feelings. Their memory is imprinted. But Allah Ta'ala we don't see. We don't see Him. We don't see directly, physically, the care that's provided. Although Allah Ta'ala says, look at the results, look at the signs in creation. So how are we to know the one who cannot be seen? Allah Ta'ala provides guidance for us in the Quran and the Prophet ﷺ provides guidance in the Hadith. All of this is what we will explain in further detail. So number one, and this is a list of 10 items inshallah, which I will go through. Number one on this list, is to believe in the unity of Allah Ta'ala. The first thing, the most important thing which Allah Ta'ala has emphasized in all the teachings of all the religions which were sent by Allah Ta'ala is to believe in Allah Ta'ala as being one. La ilaha illallah. This is the first part of our creed, creedal statement. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also in Surah Hud, Allah Ta'ala mentioned that all of the messengers were sent with this same message. To believe in one God and to believe in Allah Ta'ala's Messenger or Messengers, depending according to the, the Messenger who came and the Messengers who had preceded. 
So the first half is always the same in every religion. La ilaha illallah, that Allah is one. And he explained this to us in Surah Al-Ikhlas. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allah is one. That's the first statement, that Allah is one. Don't have this multitude, this multiplicity of gods. That power is distributed between different entities. One for weather, one for food and so on. This distribution, that's nullified. Second, the partnership. The sense of equality between deities. The sense that there are many of them and they are equal and they are sharing power. He is one. So he is to not, ha not to have partners associated with him, neither is his power to be considered distributed. Neither is worship to be given to anyone other than him. The rights which are his are to be enjoined, enjoyed only by him. The right to be worshipped and to have all power, ultimate power and all care attributed to, this is unique to him. Allahu Ahad. Then he said, Allahu Samad. Now he explains further. Allah Samad, Allah is the one. As Samad is the one, sometimes it's translated as self-reliant. As Samad is the one that everyone turns to and he doesn't turn to anyone. Everyone depends on him and he depends on no one. The philosophers talk about cause and effect in creation. They talk about the first cause, the second cause and all of creation emanating from that. They talk about the fact that, for example, we look at ourselves, we say, how did we get here? And we say there must be some entity which provides the things that we rely on. So everything has a cause and effect, there's a chain of causation. So each entity is reliant on something which precedes it. Without our parents, how can we come into being? So we are dependent on our parents in order to come into being. We have to acknowledge this. How did our parents come into being? They have reliant on their parents. So there is a chain. But when we go all the way back, we see everyone is dependent on someone. But he is the one who everyone depends on and he doesn't depend on anyone. So this is Allahu Samad, self-reliant, self-determinant. No one has the authority to interfere with his power. He says, فَعَالٌ لِمَا يريد. When he makes an irada, an intention, there is none who can challenge his power and interfere with his decision. Whereas everyone else, is subject to his power. Illa masha Allah. He always said in the Quran, Illa masha Allah. You can ask for something, you can wish for something, etc. But Illa masha Allah. Except if Allah wills. If He wills otherwise, then He can interfere with anyone. But no one can interfere with His intention. Allahu Samad. Then He explained, I gave you the example just now of being born. Because this is a very obvious example that a person is born or a, a creature is born. And it's very obvious that you are dependent on the one from whom you came. It's very obvious that a person is dependent on the mother, for example. So he said, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. In both directions, neither does he give birth to anyone, nor did anyone give birth to him. So there is none who can claim to be in succession from him, or to be antecedent from him. Neither progeny nor ancestry can be claimed from him. There is none who can say that I originate from him or that I cause him to be originated. So this is another sense in which he is one. Because we see other creation, we see that there is this chain that we need parents and then we have children. And this is how beings come into existence. So he said that his one of his characteristics is that he is not dependent on this origination, this moment when you come into being, like happens to all of us. He's not dependent on parents and he doesn't come into being at a per moment in time. In the same way, he doesn't <laughs> give birth to anyone in the sense that no one can claim that that is their origin, that they originated directly from him either. لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ and then last is وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ And there is none like unto him. There is none that is equal to him. There is nothing comparable with him. Here in uh, Surah Ash-Shura, uh, chapter 42, verse 11, there is another verse of the Qur'an. He said, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ So here, since we have not seen him, Allah Ta'ala explains to us who he is, sometimes by saying what he has done, but in other places by what he is not. 
So you can give someone knowledge by negation as well. So the negation here is Laysa kamithlihi shay'un is that he is not like anything else. So any characteristics that we see, any limitations that we see, any creation that we see, all of these will put limits on things. He says, Laysa kamithlihi shay'un. It's human nature. We look around us, we see some things. Ibrahim alayhi salam had this dialogue in the Quran. He looks at the sun, he looks at the moon. The, well, first he starts with the stars, then the moon, then the sun. He's looking at the celestial bodies, thinking, well, they are otherworldly. And he's reasoning. And then he's thinking, well, they are greater than us on earth. So perhaps that could be God. This is a speculative analysis. But then he says, no, everything, because it sets, it disappears, it declines, there is another one greater than that. The sun, moon is greater than the stars, he says the sun is greater than the moon, and the sun itself then it sets. So none of these are capable of being God, since everyone is dependent on him. He can't be one who sets, or disappears, or someone is greater than him. This is not the nature of God. So Allah Ta'ala said, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ They don't look for Allah in creation. Don't look at the things that you are dependent on, such as the warmth of the sun, or food which comes from your animals, or anything else, and start to worship them, thinking that because I am dependent on this creature or this creation, then that becomes my God. He said, no, لَيْسَكَ مِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ You can't compare him to anything in creation. Even the mithil. Mithil means similitude. Not, just, not only equality, but even mithil. That he is above all of this. So this is one thing that he says, don't limit his power, your understanding of him should not be limited by the limitations you see in creation. <laughs> okay, so this is the first thing, that we believe that Allah is one and there is none to be associated with him, either in his existence or in his power or in his likeness. None is to be compared with him. <laughs> Secondly, we acknowledge his ownership and sincerely seek his pleasure. The sovereignty of all things, including over the creation, is Allah Ta'ala's. And we sincerely seek his pleasure. He said in Surah Az-Zumar, chapter 39, verse 67, He said, وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ They did not give Allah Ta'ala due regard. حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ the way he should have been appreciated. In this world, people disobey Allah Ta'ala because they have not yet felt the full effect of his power or seen his majesty fully revealed because he gives them time and so they do not appreciate him. وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ The way they should have. Meaning that they should have obeyed him. They should have been obedient. They should have worshipped him alone. They should have been subservient before him. But why didn't they do that? Because his glory, his majesty, his power was veiled from them. But he says on the day of judgment, he says, وَالْأَرْضُ جَمِيعًا قَبْدَتُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ But all of this earth will be encompassed in his power on the day of judgment. It is encompassed now, but it will be visible and apparent on the day of judgment. Meaning that truth will be revealed to them, apparent before their eyes on the day of judgment that the earth and everything within the earth is entirely subject to his power. Then they will realize that they should have appreciated him to a greater extent. They should have worshipped him and obeyed him. وَالْأَرْضُ جَمِيعًا قَبْدَتُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ He said, وَالسَّمَاوَاتُ يَطْمَطْوِيَاتٌ بِيَمِينِهِ And all of these heavens, this vast universe that you see, expansive, going further and further, they put probes now into the heavens. 10, 20, 30 years later they are still going. They still get images back sometimes. Still going. And they haven't even touched the early stages of what, is the, what there is in space. Much further to go. He said all of this will be rolled up in his right hand. This is figurative, metaphoric language. Allah Ta'ala knows best physically how this will manifest. But he says all of this will be rolled up in his right hand. Allah Ta'ala refers in the Quran to his hand. And different people interpreted this in different ways, but the scholars indicate, they take from this, that the reference to the right hand is a symbol of power. 
It's not like my right hand and your right hand. But this is a symbol of his power that they will see because the right hand is this power. We have strength in there. Often they will hold a scepter or something to show. The rulers will hold, hold something in the right hand. It's a symbol of power. So all of this will be encompassed by Amine. So they will see that everything is in his grasp. And then, if all of this dominion, if the sovereignty of all of this creation is Allah Ta'ala, belongs to Allah Ta'ala, then what should they have done? They should have obeyed him. They should have made effort for him. They should have tried to please him. They should have expended all the God-given gifts that they had in obedience to him. So Allah Ta'ala says in Surah At-Tawbah, chapter 9, verse 111, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اشْتَرَى مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ بِأَنَّ لَهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ That surely Allah Ta'ala, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اشْتَرَى He has made a contract. He has made a contract with the believers. He has, done a, he has completed a transaction with the believers. اشتراء meaning to buy. When you go to purchase something. Say, if you give me these goods, I will give you this payment. So there is a transaction. Offer and acceptance. And in legal terms, we say consideration moves from the promisee. So you have to have these elements that you make a transaction. And you give something as a price, and in return you receive something. So Allah Ta'ala explaining this to the, to the people. To explain to them that you have a duty to me. You have a covenant with me. But to explain to them that they will not be shortchanged. That they will get back full recompense. He says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اشْتَرَى مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ He is purchased from you, the believers. Two things, أَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ Every physical gift that you have, your soul, your life, your health, and all of the physical exertion and effort that you can make, every love in your heart, every effort, every exertion of yours, every focus of yours, and fusahum, everything Allah Ta'ala has purchased. Wa amwalahum, every gift that He gave you, every financial resource, every material gift, everything that you claim to own, to possess, all of this he has purchased from you. But in return, بِأَنَّ لَهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ If you give all of this for the sake of Allah, He will give you Jannah. بِأَنَّ لَهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ So this means that every gift that Allah has given you, your health, your wealth, and all that I have mentioned, He is saying it should be expended for the sake of Allah. Make this effort for Allah. Expend your financial resources. Use your physical health. Exert your effort. Give your time. Every resource at your disposal, give it for the sake of Allah. Use it in obedience to the command of Allah. He will give you Jannah. <coughs> and he said to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Surah Al-An'am, Chapter 6, Verse 162, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ the Qur'an always trains and shapes and guides the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, educates him. And through his example, it educates his followers. He says to the Prophet ﷺ, say, give testimony, utter this with your tongue. Utter it with your tongue so you can internalize. When we say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ, the purpose of the utterance is to evidence the belief which is inside. So he said, utter this with your tongue so that it becomes a conviction inside your heart. Qul, say this, utter these words, Inna salati, undoubtedly, my worship, wa nusuki, and my sacrifice, meaning all the dedication that I have to worship a God, a creator, all of this is for Allah. Inna salati. Then, wa nusuki, every single love that I have in this world, material things, people, everything to whom I am attached, I am willing to give all of this up for the sake of Allah. Wanusuki. I will sacrifice every love of this world for the sake of Allah. Wanusuki. Wa mahyaya wa mamati. And my dying and my living, my departure from this world into the hereafter is to meet with Allah. My living in this world to earn, is to earn good deeds for the pleasure of Allah. Going from this world is a meeting with Allah. And being in this world is to earn for the pleasure, for the meeting, to prepare for the meeting with Allah. Mahyaya wa mamati. 
Lillahi Rabbil Alameen. All of this is for Allah, Lord of the worlds. So to acknowledge his sovereignty means that you accept that everything you have belongs to him. And it is to be used to please him. This helps us to understand that when something we love is taken away from us, that it was Allah's in the first place and he has the power to take it back. Inna lillahi wa inna ilihi rajiun. This is why we are told to utter these words. It helps us to understand our purpose here and our limitations as well. Number three, knowing that Allah Ta'ala is aware that if we know Allah Ta'ala, if we acknowledge Him as our Lord, then we should know that He is aware of everything that we do. This is the notion of accountability. That if we live on this earth, whatever we do, Allah Ta'ala is aware. That He will hold us to account. So that we are always checking within ourselves, is Allah Ta'ala pleased with me? Is he happy with the way I spend my life? Is he happy with the way I treat my family? Is he happy with the way I live in the community? Is he happy with the way I earn my rizq? Is he happy with the things I look at? Is he happy with the things I listen to? Is he happy with the things I utter? Is he happy with the way I spend my time? Is he happy with the way I spend my days? Is he happy with the ways I spend my nights? Is he happy with the people I keep companionship with? We are always checking. He said in Surah Al-Mulk, وَأَسِرُّوا قَوْلَكُمْ أَوِجْهَرُوا بِهِ إِنَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصدور. Say it quietly. Asirru qawlakum. Make a secret of it. Sir means a secret. He said, wa asirru qawlakum. Make your speech very secret. Whisper it in corners if you wish. Awijharu bih. Or proclaim it in front of people. Innahu alimun bidhati sudur. He is the one alim. This means that he is most knowledgeable. The alim is the one who is most knowledgeable. He is very knowledgeable of bidhati sudur, everything which is in the hearts. Be it a thought, a fleeting idea, an emotion, an intention, something which has not even yet formed as a plan in your mind. Forget the deed. The idea, the fleeting glimpse of an idea that you may do something. An emotion that you have, maybe karaha, some sort of distaste for something that you have developed. He is alimun bidhati sudur. He knows your intentions before you have made them. And he knows every emotion, everything bidhati sudur. And he said also in Surah Al-Anfal, chapter 8, verse 24, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَحُولُ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَقَلْبِهِ وَعْلَمُوا Know this. Have certain knowledge. Ilm is certain knowledge. وَعْلَمُوا Have certainty of knowledge. أن الله that Allah يحول that He surrounds بين المرء وقلبه يحول بين المرء وقلبه مرء meaning a man وقلب meaning the heart Allah تعالى surrounds what is between a man and his heart every innermost thought every thing about a man that is between the man and his heart Allah تعالى surrounds this he also said elsewhere, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ Surah Qaf, chapter 50 of the Qur'an. He's nearer to him than his jugular vein. He's nearer than life. He surrounds what is between a man and his heart, meaning even the secret things between a man and his own inner self, Allah Ta'ala surrounds everything. He encompasses everything. Nothing is hidden from him. In the hadith collection, the 40 uh, hadith collection of Imam Nawabi, rahmatullahi ta'ala, it's the hadith from Muslim Sharif. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Hadith Jibreel. Inshallah, we'll stop on this now. In Hadith Jibreel, there's an exchange, a dialogue between Jibreel Alayhi and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They talk about the notion of what is Islam, what is Iman, what is Ihsan. In the context of Ihsan, they talk about worship. And so, then, in the dialogue, Jibreel Alayhi Wasallam asks the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is Ihsan? And so the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, explaining the notion of Ihsan in the worship, he says that you should worship Allah Ta'ala as if you see Him. When you worship Allah as if you are seeing Him. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that you imagine Him physically in front of you, but it means if you were to be looking at Allah Ta'ala, how awed would you be by His resplendent majesty? How humble would you be in front of His power and His glory? So as if you are looking at Him. But of course, we can't look at Allah Ta'ala. So then the hadith 
he, hadith continues وَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكَ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ And if it is the case, which it is, that you cannot see him لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكَ Then you should at least acknowledge that he is looking at you. Meaning this worship that we do in front of Allah Ta'ala should be acknowledging the power and the glory of Allah Ta'ala and knowing that even though we are incapable of seeing him but he is always watching us and to know that humility that dutiness, dutifulness that servitude which comes and that we are standing before the one who is our master our creator our owner our sovereign the one who we are dependent on the one who we will be held accountable to the one who knows what is between us and our hearts the one who encompasses with his knowledge all our deeds, our thoughts, our intentions. And that is the quality of the believer when he stands in front of Allah Ta'ala with Ihsan. So inshallah, we covered three points this week. Believing in the unity of Allah, acknowledging his ownership and sincerely seeking his pleasure and knowing that he is aware. Inshallah, we'll continue from there next time. Wa